Let's go to the cloud. All right, we're gonna talk about the basics of working up liver disease, but in the basics, there's some very advanced comments I'm gonna have for everybody. I'm not gonna talk a lot about coronavirus because you all are very familiar with vaccination, treatment, hospitalization, and that people with chronic liver disease have a higher mortality rate, especially if people have cirrhosis, if they get corona infections. And corona can worsen liver disease, uh, both uh, directly through viral interactions, as well as uh, issues with drug drugs, side effects of drugs, and drug-drug interactions. So I'll keep the coronavirus short, but we can talk about that at the end. Let's see if I can get these slides to go forward. There we go. Who should be tested for liver disease? People coming in with abdominal symptoms, vague symptoms, uh, unexplained fevers, uh, fatigue, uh, it, almost any symptom complex could be a sign of acute or chronic liver injury. Of course, if there's risk history, risk behavior, and if there are elevated liver tests on any blood tests, one time occasionally you may advocate to retest, uh, but if you have twice elevated liver enzymes, it's time to do our initial workup, our phase one workup, and we'll talk about when to do phase two or phase three workup. Many patients get referred for liver disease because of an abnormal CT or ultrasound or sometimes MR scan, typically showing fatty liver or chronic liver disease. These are all entry points. Now, some things have changed. We're testing everybody for hepatitis C. We're testing everybody for hepatitis B. So you need to know that that standard of care, you're doing your GI workup, you're doing your colonoscopies, you're doing your endos for other issues. Every patient needs to have a C antibody and hep B triple panel. Anybody with HIV, immigrant populations, metabolic syndrome, psychiatric disorders, Wilson disease workup, as I was mentioning later, lung disease, alpha-1 workup. Uh, high globulins, unexplained liver tests, autoimmune disease. This is kind of our short list. Anybody who's jaundiced, anybody with an abnormal liver on physical exam, anybody with signs of cirrhosis, abnormal liver imaging, we mentioned already, right upper quadrant pain, family history of liver disease, these are all going to be triggers. Everybody knows the liver enzyme and liver function dialogue. We've had that many times in the past. I want to make sure all the new fellows are aware that AST, ALT, ALKFOS, and GGT are not liver function tests. They're not LFTs. These are liver enzymes. So for your fellowship and for the rest of your career, I would be delighted if you all stick with this new terminology. Bilirubin, albumin, INR, those are your best liver function tests, specifically direct bilirubin. Lactate's a good liver function test low glucose, low cholesterol, abnormal clotting factors, and we'll talk about TEG uh, a little bit later, replacing INR. Ammonia, a terrible test. We say the people who check ammonia blood tests are more confused than their patients. Do a physical exam. Do a neurologic exam. That makes a difference. That is a semi-quantitative assessment. All right, you have a patient with an elevated ALT. Half of those patients or more are going to have fatty liver. Substantial number, at least in the 14% range, probably 20%, are going to have alcohol-associated liver disease. We don't call it alcoholic anymore. It's alcohol use disorder. It's alcohol-associated liver disease. Very important. New terminology, be current. NASH and NAFLD have changed. If you're in Asia, it's MAFLD, M-A-F-L-D, Metabolic Associated Fatty Liver Disease. If you're in Europe and the US, it's MASLD, Metabolic Associated Steatotic Liver Disease. Those are the new names, the whole story behind that that we'll go into later this year when we do a fatty liver talk. I'm just calling it fatty liver from now on, so I don't have to worry about all these initials. All right. Other function tests, we don't use galactose, clearance, aminopyrene, ICG, but later on in this talk, I'm gonna talk about some exciting new liver function tests that hopefully will be uh, FDA cleared this next year. You could be ordering those in your hospital, or your clinic. Every patient needs an ALT, ALKFOS, 
AST and GGT. Healthy for women is under 25, healthy for men is under 30. A couple of the new guidelines go up to 30 for women, up to 35 for men. But once you're at 36 or 38 or 39, don't ignore it. Either retest after an intervention, such as stopping alcohol, or start your workup, the big six that we're gonna talk about in a moment. Be aware, alkaline phosphatase is a problem in children. Alkaline phosphatase is a problem during pregnancy in terms of interpretation. That's why you just get a GGT on everybody. That's your panel. And if the total bilirubin is greater than 0.6, everybody gets a direct bilirubin. Of course, you're gonna take a history, you're gonna do a physical exam, you're gonna do a review of systems, you're gonna do a medical history, family history, personal history, travel history, raw food, medications, over-the-counter, supplements, vitamins, all super important. The medication history, I tell people to bring in their medicines, fill out a form, and then I ask them to It's not just the paperwork, they forget things. What about herbs, over-the-counter, uh, supplements, uh, traditional Chinese medicines? These are all ways you can ask to get exposure to what they're really consuming and what their real risk might be for elevated liver tests. Social history. My way of getting to the alcohol is, yes, I ask them how much they drink, if they had any consequences. I order a PETH, P-E-T-H test. PETH test is the state of the art for assessing alcohol exposure. And the PETH test looks back six weeks. And there's a lot of other things on here that you're going to know or you're gonna take in terms of a history. Physical exam, you've already been through this, medical students, residencies, now in your fellowship. I just put a list here for everybody's review. Do a good physical exam, lay on the hands, look at the chest, look at the back, do a full physical on the abdomen. Don't say the liver's two fingers below the right costal margin, that's terrible. You're gonna say the liver is so many centimeters in height by percussion, same thing with spleen. I mentioned before, repeating the test once depends on the history. Someone said they've been drinking a lot. They come in with an AST of 50 or 60, an ALT of 40 or 50. You just say, stop the alcohol. We'll retest you in one to two months. And then if you still are abnormal, uh, we'll do an extensive lab workup and consider a biopsy. ALT, this is data that's eight years old. I'm going to say right now in 2023, 30% of the adult population have high liver enzymes. And this is due mostly to fatty liver, some of it's alcohol, some is alcohol on top of fatty liver. And of course you're gonna write down symptoms and are the symptoms or the changes, review of systems, acute or chronic, and then back to the liver enzymes, you're gonna take a good history on what that pattern is. And just one second, I'm gonna turn off my video for just a minute, because I need to stretch my legs. I've got a little bit of a cramp here. All right, uh, let's keep going. This is a little bit more recent study, um, just looking at what are factors that lead uh, to or can cause elevated liver enzymes, um, similar to what we talked about before, just a little bit more updated, but really fatty liver is at least half of the problem today. But this is the simple answer. Somebody's got elevated ALT twice on exam. These are the tests you're gonna do on everybody. Hepatitis B triple panel, but the surface antigen is the most important here. Hepatitis C antibody, iron saturation, not ferritin. You're gonna do an alcohol history such as cage testing, but I mentioned PEF, PEF is a great blood test. You can take that medication history and you're gonna evaluate for metabolic syndrome. So this is your big six. You need to remember this the rest of your career and make sure that these are checked um, before you go down a more advanced workup, which we will get to in just a moment. This is what I do. These patients come in, their first workup's negative, and I start thinking about autoimmune disease. Do I need to do a biopsy? Do they have too much iron? Do I need to do an MR scan? They have Wilson disease. It's a biopsy. It's KF rings. It's urine copper of course, ceruloplasma. They have lung disease or unexplained liver disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin level. If the level's low, you can get a phenotype and you may get a biopsy to sort that out. I had a patient with cryptogenic liver disease last week, got a biopsy, alpha-1 everywhere. 
My staff, who was told to check an alpha-1 level, didn't, but now they're checking it, of course, but the biopsy really helps us tease out. Is this alpha-1? Is it autoimmune? Is it fatty liver? Um, so uh, it is really a combination of tests. AMA positive, that's primary biliary cholangitis, elevated uh, alphos, GDT, and a man more likely to be PSC, and you're going to do an MRCP in those, in those cases. More likely to do a biopsy in women, more likely to do an MRCP in men. Of course, if you've got inflammatory bowel disease, you're going to go down the MRCP sooner. If it's a man who's got elevated enzymes, negative AMA, but high IgM, very likely to be PVC, but you may get a biopsy to wrap that up. Celiac disease, every year I diagnose one or two people with celiac disease because they have elevated liver tests. It's cryptogenic. Nobody thought of the celiac disease. Uh, vascular disease, heart failure, but Chiari, portal vein thrombosis, sinusoidal obstructive syndrome are all part of the big hepatology world that I live in, that you all will be living in. This has to do with AST and ALT, the level under 300, you can take your time. Over 300 to 500, get an expedient workup done. Over two to 3,000, you may need to put them in the hospital. One of the biggest messages I have here is you need to get a blood alcohol level, a PEF test, and a sedum anathen level on everybody. Don't depend on your history. Just do the blood tests. You need to document and back up your history, whatever direction that may be going. If AST is higher than the ALT, then you know they have one of two issues. 80%, this is due to cirrhosis. 20% is due to alcohol exposure. And of course you can have alcohol plus cirrhosis. If you have a high AST, higher than ALT, another time to do that testing that we talked about. Um, this is a very, very useful test. It's part of my big seven I use to establish fibrosis level in patients, especially when I know they're not drinking. AST can come from muscle, of course. These are enzymes that have a function in gluconeogenesis, but back to the muscle story, they're big runners, a lot of exercise, they're in the sun, they're working hard, the hot uh, toiling temperatures, um, liver enzymes may be up for muscle injury. Um, AST is both in the cytosol and mitochondria, the cirrhotic patients, the ratio in the mitochondria is greater than the cytoplasm. It gets released from mitochondrial toxicity. This explains why the AST is higher in cirrhotics because there's less cytoplasm. There's less AST in the cytoplasm. Just kind of interesting that that helps us that way alongside platelet count, ultrasound with spleen size, portal vein diameter, APRI score, FIB4 score, uh, KPA liver stiffness. So when cells die, they can either go through apoptosis or necrosis. And some cells, when they're sick, aren't dead, but they're just leaking enzymes. So there's really three different explanations on a cellular basis why these enzymes um, can be elevated. Apoptosis on the left, necrosis with inflammation, some polys, some lymphocytes on the right. Cholestasis is an impairment of bile flow, classically presents with high alt-FOS and GGT. If you have a high alt-FOS and a normal GGT, first thing you think of is hyperparathyroidism. Every year I diagnose at least one person, that's 30 or 40 people, I picked it up. Um, high alt-FOS, um, some mild hyperbilirubinemia, but GGT is normal, you need to really think about doing genetic testing for PFIC. There's 11 different types of um, familial intrahepatic cholestasis, and there's some other syndromes that we can talk about uh, later if you want to later this year. Alphos can be high in pregnancy, it can be high in children, it can be high in hyperparathyroidism. So that's why you need to pair Alphos and GGT in every patient. Of course, this bile duct issue can be microscopic or macroscopic. The macroscopic is where the MRCP comes into use. And the MRCP can assess quite far up into the liver into the segmental ductal branches. Um, but it really, you will get a big hint about this um, disease, the disease present. 
um, in these patients, depending on enzyme pattern, and more importantly, what you see on the MRCP. Um, ELKFOS has isoenzymes also, so it can come from intestine, pancreas, placenta, brain, other areas. But bone is really the big one besides the liver. Um, granulomatous disease, sarcoid, TB can cause a high um, ELKFOS also, and that would lead to a much lower threshold to get a liver biopsy. This is um, ELKFOS elevation by age. It's in younger people because of bone turnover. But I think low vitamin D levels influences bone turnover, can cause a high ALK-FOS, and that's where the GGT comes back into play. And if they have a low vitamin D level, you can't explain the high ALK-FOS on any other basis and put them on vitamin D and follow the alkaline phosphatase after their workup's been done. It's more on GGT, another test called 5 nucleotidase which we don't use. Um, and really, I think this should be standard of care. It's not standard of care, because Medicare decided 30 some years ago, too many people were getting worked up for their high GGT, which we want to have that done now. Um, but the high GGT with, um, uh, that could be high in a variety of different syndromes, genetic syndromes, including fatty liver, including alcohol. But you can't label somebody as an alcoholic or alcohol use disorder or alcohol associated liver disease just because of a high GGT or GGT higher than ALKFOS. You really gotta do your homework. Um, talked about MRCP, here we're talking about ANCA, SMIN, GGT higher than ALKFOS. Um, and a, a, a woman, GGT ALKFOS dominant, GGT higher than ALKFOS, you're gonna get an AMA. If the AMA is negative, you're gonna get an IgM test. IgM really uh, helps with that assessment. GDT is a predictor of cardiovascular events and mortality. Very, very useful. So you can talk to your patients about heart disease while you're talking about their liver disease. It's an amazingly useful enzyme. I'm just shocked it's not more used. Bilirubin comes from a production or a breakdown of heme molecules that are in cytochrome or in hemoglobin. Um, and then there's issues of impaired uptake, conjugation, or excretion. I'm not going to go into a lot on Gilbert Aroda. Rotor syndrome or Krigler in a jar, Newman Johnson now, but we might get into that later in the year. So we had some great discussions about a month ago with the fellows on this issue. Direct bilirubin, greater than 0.3, that's major liver dysfunction. And that is your friend. Healthy bilirubin should be 0.6 or less. Healthy bilirubin, direct, should be 0.3 or less. Even one point above those thresholds it's time to be doing some workup um, on those patients and talking about liver synthetic dysfunction. Of course, high bilirubin total and high bilirubin direct is gonna cause to make patients more jaundiced, but the indirect is even worse because that's lipid soluble. That's the worst, I guess. Um, yeah, so lipid soluble is right, the right thing I'm saying. This goes into more detail um, on bilirubin production and metabolism. You need to know these things for your boards. This is pretty simple. And talking about sources of bilirubin, you mentioned cytochrome, but heme oxygenase and heme molecules are very um, in involved here too. This just talks about how bilirubin is monoglucuronidase, diglucuronidase, moved into canaliculus, excreted into the bile. So if you have an inhibition of glucuronidation, you're going to have another uh, cholestatic syndrome that could result in liver failure. Scott's more about the infants and pediatric with um, infant and adolescent or childhood um, jaundice. Gilbert, who was um, originally British, kicked out of England, went to France, republished all his data. That's why I call him Gilbert, not Gilbert. Um, as the person that published this information, uh, late 1800s, as I recall, or 1850 or 1860. Um, so think about jaundice, obstruction, think about alcohol use, get an alcohol blood level, get a PEP test, acute liver injury, always get an acetaminophen level, it doesn't matter what their history is, just order it. There's acetaminophen in 30 different over-the-counter products in any given uh, drug, drugstore. All right, Gilbert syndrome, you can do genetic testing that's quite inexpensive. The UDP glucuronyl uh, transferase is the uh, disease state here. They've got unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but you also can see that 
unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in other clinical settings, including uh, hemolysis. So you have to do your workup gently before you jump down uh, doing genetic testing for some of these other uh, syndromes. Uh, Krigler and Ajar, I've seen two cases in my lifetime. It's unlikely you'll see those unless you're overlapping with the pediatric service, but occasionally they live to adults. A little bit more about Gilbert syndrome, no biopsy, no cholangiography, Alphos is normal, urine tests normal. Um, this just talks about what could happen with unconjugated bilirubin. It could go quite high, um, about four to six range, which can push that direct up into the four to six range or higher. Uh, look at that. A lot more details on Gilbert syndrome. People with Gilbert syndrome live longer. Isn't that amazing? It acts like an antioxidant. So I guess if you had your choice, you're going to do genetic programming or reprogramming, get uh, Gilbert syndrome in there. And it doesn't cause any disease. Uh, a little bit more on Gilbert syndrome. I'll let you look at this later, um, but you need to know this because if you're in a liver practice, you know, one out of 10, one out of 12 people you see is going to have Gilbert syndrome. Some people get sent to me with Gilbert syndrome um, with a path form and said, I need a liver biopsy. And I go, I'm not dealing with this. Go to the staff, they know how to book these appointments. So um, Gilbert syndrome, a lot of people like to do this UDGP um, you know, genetic testing. I usually don't need it, but it's interesting when people do that. There are some drug-drug uh, interactions or drug genetic interactions that can help you manage your patients. Um, so building Rubin does a lot of different things. There's a whole list here about circad circadian patterns, cardioprotection, muscle homeostasis, modulation of gut microbiome, inhibits carcinogenesis, has an immunomodulatory effect. I think this is fascinating. I just rarely use it in my practice. Dubin Johnson is prone here, super dark liver. Um, Dubin Johnson doesn't have any specific clinical disease typically. Serum bilirubin mostly conjugated, and the frequency is rare. Uh, liver histology uh, quite um, non diagnostic. You're in, uh, porphyrin, um, corporate porphyrin is elevated in Dubin Johnson, so you can do a urine porph porphyrin workup. Rotor syndrome, uh, inherited conjugated hyperbilirubinemia as a defect in hepatic storage. So you just keep making more and more of this until you get potentially liver problems or liver failure. Um, your urine screen can help you, but I had some negative urine screens because patients forgot to collect their urine. And um, they basically makes my job difficult. Regular Najjar, a little bit more on those. You can look at these later. So we'll probably have one question on each of those on your boards, but I don't know what they're going to ask. So I just say get some broad-based education. Um, this is a study in PBC patients that came up with what is a normal total bilirubin. And once you have a total bilirubin greater than 0.6, you're at much higher risk of having liver-related mortality. I think everybody wants to know that. You have a PBC patient. The total bilirubin was 0 0.5, then it goes to 0.6, then 7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. That's telling you that person's having worsening synthetic dysfunction. You need to bring them in um, for a full assessment. They have cirrhosis. It's even more serious, but uh, we can talk more about that later. Albumin, anything under 4 is probably abnormal. Anything under 3.5, they've lost a lot of albumin or having synthetic problems. 3.5 is super magical. But if somebody wants to be checking um, and working that patient up when they're between 3.5 and 4, that's a worthwhile process. And I've seen a lot of my hep C patients um, have um, this change. And I'm starting to track that albumin change over time um, and make sure, of course, they don't have nephrotic syndrome. They don't have another reason that they're losing albumin or some type of protein losing enteropathy, but those are quite rare. So we talked about albumin. I'm going to keep going here for time. Um, about halfway through. Uh, this is about pro time. And I'm going to make a strong recommendation that you use thromboelastography in all your liver patients if you're doing procedures. And that's available to um, hospital or clinic in uh, any urban area. So TAG is your friend. You should be ordering that and using that. If you don't have it at your hospital, 
I can help you work on it to get it in there. This is what the tag test does. You put the blood in a little cup. There's a spinning pin and a little cylinder. It gets restriction in terms of this um, action. And once that action gets more stiff, the liver enzymes start getting smaller. These enzymes can be pointed directly at specific sites, and that's a definite possibility for us to do. This is what it looks like. You got a patient coming with fulminant liver failure, acute on chronic liver failure, trauma with very high enzymes, trauma, high enzymes, high INR, get a tag test done. And this will tell you, and using these numbers, I've got some additional tables I can show you. Um, you're going to want to look at those numbers and decide what to do. One option is to get, you know, have, you know, uh, support for those people. If you have a long SP or what I call that R interval on the left side, that's fresh frozen is going to be your supplement. Um, if that angle, that alpha angle, or what we call the K is a challenge, those patients need cryoprecipitate. Um, and on the right side, you need an antifibrinolytic fibrinolytic agent um, to make that very even across the top instead of coming back in like a spindle. Here's a tag decision tree with lots of different symbolic uh, changes on here. Um, but really the one on the top left corner, second on the left and third down on the left are the prominent ones you're gonna see in your practice. You'll be deciding whether you're gonna use platelets, cryoprecipitate or a fresh frozen plaza to correct one of the components that you see on this before you do a major intervention. Minor interventions like endoscopy with banding, minor interventions such as paracentesis does not need any correction. There are prothrombotic states, but those are harder to diagnose. Every patient in the hospital or you see who's got cirrhosis needs to have a child pew score done. So put in the number, child pew, CTP. There's a lot of abbreviations, but it goes from, um, let's see, uh, five to 15 and you need to be scoring your patients sequentially, A6, B7, B9, depending on the scores. Same thing, every cirrhotic patient, every appointment, every day in clinic, every day in the hospital, you need to be calculating a MELD score. There's now MELD 3.0, which includes albumin and gender. So uh, that is your best way to predict one month, three month, five month, and even one year survival. MELD score, super useful. Uh, low lymphocyte count, I see all the time. People are using it to be a marker of liver dysfunction and some type of major injury. Pregnant patient comes in, you need to have a, a hep C and a hep B panel in that patient's chart when you see them. You're on the OB service, gynecology service, other things, you're consulting on that. Make sure every adult patient you see has a hepatitis C and B test in their chart. If not, Order it. Uh, this is ALT, an elevated out FOS, greater than 110, GGT greater than 40. Uh, most likely it's going to be fatty liver, but you need to think about going further for a biopsy or further for a, a hepatobiliary, depending on how that, you know, the whole package workup takes place. Uh, we talked about alcohol history. High MCV is another history about chronic alcohol use. Elastography is a favorite now. It's usually fiber scan, but there's five or six machines that measure liver stiffness as well as MR scan. Um, the VCTE tool can also check a CAP score and tell you what the percent body fat is. There's a quantitative liver spleen scan. I heard again about it today from um, one of my emails, hepatique, um, but it does calculate shunting, liver mass, liver function. This hepatique is really good. And I'll talk later about something called HEPQUANT, which is a bile acid derived test for bile acid clearance for shunting and liver function. APRI and FIB4, super important online calculators that you can have. There's something called Multiscan that measures fibrosis, fat, inflammation, and iron. Um, I've left inflammation off this slide. FibroSure, FibroTest, FibroSpec, I don't order those. ELF, I don't order. Uh, very expensive. Um, not sure how they help at this time. I need more data. But I do calculate a NAFLD or NAS score that's also online and easily calculated. 
On here on the far left side, you'll see a box called HEPQuant. That's the one that I've been working on with a company. I have a conference call with them on Friday, actually. They're trying to get it through the FDA. Um, and you take an oral solution or an oral plus an IV and it calculates shunts fraction. That just helps predict varices and portal hypertension. But more importantly, it tells you about liver function and the chances of dying. Um, and you just need to have be aware of this earlier intervention to give your patient support. I hate liver spleen scans. I've never had any use for them. I just don't order them anymore. But that could be a topic for discussion. Direct and indirect alcohol use. We mentioned PET. That's a blood alcohol. There's also a urine PETH. There's a hair analysis for PETH as well as ethyl glucuronide, ETG. Um, and if you see an MCB over 103, you need to either do a B12 alcohol test or both. It could be both. A little bit more on this ethyl glucuronide hair test. I've never ordered this. It's expensive. It's hard to get paid for. Pain in the neck. Uh, but if you need to document somebody's alcohol-free, this is another good way. Imaging, you want to get a full abdominal ultrasound Doppler on all your liver patients. Um, in those patients, you want to get a portal vein diameter. You want to get a spleen size and follow the 12-12 rule. Greater than 12 millimeters, greater than 12 centimeters. They need an upper endoscopy. They need to start liver cancer surveillance. They need closer follow-up. Size matters, liver smoothness or roughness makes a difference as well. Nodular surface helps. So, MAFL, NASL, NAFL, NASH, MASH, very, very common liver disease. 60 to 80 million people in the US, 15 to 20 million have active clinical disease. So, there's lots of work to do here for us in society. Monjuro, semiglutide, liraglutide are all in this um, treatment process in terms of weight loss and better diabetes control. That they would rather you, um, the insurance companies would rather you get uh, a workup done and not spend money on these expensive diabetes drugs, but hopefully they'll come up with a contract, drop the price and get access for everybody. There are side effects to the GLP-1 in terms of intestinal slowing, intestinal liver disease. Um, and that can cause obstruction. Um, there's a few other side effects just need to be aware of. Uh, we talked about platelets. We talked about aprifiporin, AFLD, AST to ALT ratio. We're good there. Um, do a thorough workup at the beginning. It just sets the foundation that you're really thinking, you're really caring. And you can get an answer to most of these problems easily uh, with a good history and doing a physical exam. Now we're gonna to switch to acute hepatitis. Acute hepatitis, lots of different causes, but make sure you get hepatitis A, IgM. In chronic liver disease, don't order a hepatitis A, IgM. Don't order a core IgM. They're worthless for chronic liver disease. But for acute disease, these are useful, including HEV, CMV, and Epstein-Barr. Wilson disease requires a ceruloplasmin, a liver biopsy, an ophthalmologic exam, and a colon exam. I don't think you're going to need any advanced colon care there, but um, these patients do need a full workup. And in fact, once I have cirrhosis in a patient, I'm of course doing this workup. I'm also getting an EKG and cardiac echo on those people. Tox screens are very common for hospital care, common for hospitalists. It does sometimes lead to an adversarial position with the patients. So why did you test this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing drugs of abuse? I always tell people I'm doing the test to show they're not drinking, show they're not using drugs. And if they push back, then I'm suspicious about something deeper. Acute liver injury, everybody gets an acetaminophen level. Everybody gets an alcohol assessment. Super important. These are all the drugs that can cause drug-induced liver disease. It's a whole nother lecture. We're not gonna go into that today, but take a thorough medication history. Have them stop medications, recheck tests in uh, one to two weeks, depending on how high or how low their liver enzymes are and if they have liver synthetic dysfunction. Okay, dilly, silly, milly, hilly, take a good history. It's really the bottom line. Autoimmune hepatitis, that's part of the phase two workup, especially common women commonly have elevated globulins, have a low threshold to check in ANA and smooth muscle. Low titer ANA and low titer smooth muscle are very common in fatty liver, over one to 640, or over one to 60 for smooth muscle. Those are thresholds. 
um, that you should be thinking about a biopsy. This is the place the liver biopsy is used very commonly and it's very useful. You don't biopsy hepatitis C or B patients unless they have fatty liver and we're trying to sort out which is what. The liver biopsy is the core of managing and working up autoimmune liver disease. This is very treatable. That's another talk we'll do later in the year about how to manage autoimmune hepatitis, PBC, PSC. Hopefully we can put that in one package lecture. Hemochromatosis, iron saturation over 50% twice. MR scan. Yes, you'll do the genetic mutations. You're going to follow their ferritins. That's what everybody does. You need to document how much iron they have in their liver, at first by an MR scan, second by liver biopsy. Super important. Alcohol, liver disease, seen in about a quarter of heavy drinkers. We don't know why other people are protected. Maybe it's all the coffee and tea they drink. Um, you can get cirrhosis without elevated ALTs, especially if your lab is setting the ALT normal limit in the 40, 50, 60 range, which I still see occasionally. Alcohol-related liver disease, alcohol-related hepatitis rarely has liver enzymes over 300, uh, but get a PET test and consider blood alcohol. MAFLD is a serologic diagnosis of exclusion, but if you do fatty workup in the first six tests we talked about, it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. You have an ultrasound that says fatty liver, the enzymes are high, their BMI is 40, they have diabetes, they have hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, that's what they have. So you do need to rule out the other five I talked about, but you don't need to work up every uh, fatty liver patient for Wilson disease or alpha one or PBC. Some people just shot gut, shotgun 10 different tests. We don't do that anymore. Try to be cost effective. We do the six uh, times six workup first. Alpha one had a diagnosis of an alpha one patient yesterday. Did a biopsy for cryptogenic liver disease. I don't know what their phenotype is or what their um, yeah the phenotype. Um, but you get a level. You get a phenotype if you're suspicious. You get a level, um, and then get a phenotype if the level's low. Super important. And for Wilson disease, we talked about this extensive workup that's required. So what does it all mean? It means they have, you have a patient who's got, um, in this case, we're working down the pathway of liver disease, alcohol and fatty liver are the most common. You need to intervene now to save their life. Don't take this nonchalantly, don't take it ap um, apathetically. Uh, imaging is back in the reverse, elevated liver test. Go ahead and get an ultrasound Doppler on everybody. Consider these quantitative assays at some point in the future when they are come, become available. Work up all patients with elevated liver tests with the big six, six tests, 60 minutes, $60. Uh, make sure it's not acute liver injury. If it is, that's requiring more workup. Um, and of course, imaging is a key step we re reinforce. Okay, we got through 90 slides in 45 minutes, not too bad. Yusef, you wanna bring us back? I have a question, Dr. Gish. Um